The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines, and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict." You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer. Amen. The word gospel means good news, and this doesn't sound like very good news, does it? This is what's known in religious literature, biblical literature, as apocalyptic literature. It's a rough gospel. It's scary. It's terrifying. All these wars and insurrections and things happening where people are questioned and struggling and, and then the people will be put to death, it sounds terrifying. In this apocalyptic time of the early Christian world, when Jesus left, his earliest followers expected that he would return at any minute. In fact, the disciples in the earliest Christian days used to stand outside literally looking up at the clouds for hours, waiting for Jesus to come back to them. They were so certain that he would come because they didn't want to be around when all these wars and violence was taking place. Well, today, in some ways, not much has changed. And it hasn't for 2,000 years. We might face different struggles, different trials, but it's not like now, thousands of years later, we're living in a perfect world, in a perfect community. All it takes is one look at Facebook for us to see that things are not perfect today still. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are insurrections. There are places where people are condemned and oppressed and hurt. Pastor Robert and I were talking about life in Indonesia. It's not always easy for the Christians there, right? It's not always easy around this world for people that have our faith or other faiths as well. There's a denomination in uh, the Christian tradition that doesn't believe that anything negative is real. In fact, you're not allowed to take Tylenol or stomach medication if you're having an upset stomach because what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to say that pain isn't real. And in fact, only the good things are real. And so, of course, you're supposed to refuse blood transfusions and all things that can help medically because that would be admitting that pain and suffering are real. That is not how the denomination here understands suffering. In the ELCA, the Lutheran tradition is not to say that suffering is just made up and that we just ought to have more positive thinking. Rather, suffering is real. Our own personal suffering when we're going through sickness and pain and suffering in communities and societies. We just heard this last week, a couple of days ago, of yet one more school shooting. 
You go tell those parents that that wasn't real. How would that land on them when well, they've lost a child that no longer can celebrate the holidays with them? Talk to those children in that student body that are now suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and counselors are called out in droves to try to deal with yet one more trauma in the lives of our children. Tell the country, as people as all, on all sides of the political spectrum are waiting for our country to care enough to do something to protect our nation's children, to consider it a top priority. And those of us who lose sleep over this tell those of us that this isn't real. Of course it's real. Of course suffering is real. And today's gospel is about that. Jesus himself died on a cross and then his disciples followed with a painful martyr's death, most of them, because they believed in this way, this way of love that was seen as foolish by the majority of the time. Our world scientists are telling us today that the earth itself is groaning under the strain. We, again, are not a denomination that debates science. We listen to our scientists. Our best theologians in the Lutheran church are not scientists. And so we take in the wisdom of the world scientists who say that we ought to care about climate change. We ought to care about what's going on with the earth. We ought to care about the suffering that's happening and take it seriously for future generations to be able to live on this one planet, this one home that is ours. And so in our denominations, our theologians are saying, yes, there is some suffering. The world itself is groaning, not even just the people, but the world. And it's real, and we ought to pay attention. I admire those who don't just cave, though, to despair. Who don't just give in to the news stories, to the talks of fear, to the running the other way or putting our head in the sand. I admire those who won't do that. One example is this young girl, Greta, from Europe, who's standing up to people about climate change and who's saying, I think she's 16 years old, and she's saying, we ought to look at what the scientists are telling us, and we ought to take care of this world that we've been given. She's a relatively powerless person. She's young. She's a teenager. Like the disciples, though. Teenagers have a voice, and she's using hers, and she's gathering others around to use their voice. I admire my daughter, Sophia. One day we were out driving in a car, and I always give out granola bars to people who are homeless on the side of the road, and I didn't have any in my car that day. She was in the back seat. She was probably eight or nine years old, and she said, we need to give this woman on the corner a granola bar. It's just a, a symbol of care and dignity. It's a chance to say hello and look somebody in the eyes. But I didn't have any in the car that day. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have any granola bars. And she said, we can't just give her nothing. And so she ripped out a piece of notebook paper from her school book and she wrote on it, God loves you. And she opened down her back window and handed this piece of paper to this woman that said, God loves you. And she also said, God loves you, knowing that she's staring in the face of darkness and suffering and not caving in to despair. Where I, at that moment, just saw lack. We don't have granola bars, there's nothing we could do. She stepped forward with a voice, with a message, a message of love, a message of the gospel. I admire that boy that we hear about in scripture where there's thousands of people that are hungry and the disciples came to Jesus and said, we need to feed these thousands, what are we going to do? We don't have food. And they're looking at the reality of lack and suffering and struggle, and the little boy said, well, I have a couple of fish and loaves of bread. Rather than just saying, it's not enough, we can't possibly, it's not going to go very far, we can't do it, I'm not going to give my meal, this is mine, I worked hard for it. Rather than saying all those things that would make him cling to his resources, he instead said, hey, I can share what I have. What an act of faith. What an act of goodwill. Rather than just giving in to the despair there around him that could happen. And of course, we know that Jesus then created so much out of what he had offered up that there were baskets and baskets of food left over. I admire Martin Luther. One day somebody said to him, what would happen if you knew that tomorrow the world would come to an end? And he said, today I'd plant a tree. I'd plant a tree. That's a statement of faith. That's a statement of resistance in the face of what looks like everything is lost. That's a statement of abundance in what looks like lack and scarcity. I admire those voices 
who stand up in the face of any kind of suffering and struggle and they say, I'm going to take an act of love and I'm going to hope that Jesus will turn this into something good, something abundant, something powerful, something purposeful. Because what is good and beautiful is so much stronger than what comes to us in the guise of suffering, in the guise of lack, in the guise of despair. Hope can look foolish, can't it? If you're one of those kinds of people that steps out with a word of hope when everybody's talking about the sky is falling, you look like you're totally naive. The gospel tells us this. Hope looks like foolishness to those who don't know the gospel. Of course it would. It looks like you're just Pollyanna saying everything's fine. Look, everything's not fine. It's just that you believe in the power of the gospel. You believe in the empty tomb that comes after the cross. You believe that new life follows every kind of death. It takes great power and courage to say this in a world that doesn't understand this, or that would seem illogical. And it would seem that the best we could do is give in to the voices that say that all is bad and getting worse. Well, for 2,000 years, look at any point in history, any point in history, whether it's the Dark Ages, whether it's people suffering from the plague, whether it's the holy wars, the crusades that happened for 200 years, bloodshed all over the Holy Land, Muslims and Christians killing each other all in the name of wanting that territory. Look at the wars that have happened from the Civil War where Americans killed each other. Look at World War I, the Great War, the the war to end all wars because it was so bad we'd never do it again. And then we got into World War II and then we have Korea, Vietnam. We have Christians in Ireland killing each other. We have Palestine and Israel killing each other. There's no point in history, no point that has had no suffering And yet we have had Christians for 2,000 years without break, without pause, claiming faith in the gospel. We had people in communist Russia where religion was illegal. We had people in communist China where religion was illegal. We have Christians in Indonesia that are being persecuted and yet saying strong and saying we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ more than we believe in everything going on around us that we can see that would tell us only to be afraid and to hide and to give in that the world is just doomed. Instead, these Christians for 2,000 years, in the face of everything they've gone through, have kept planting trees and planting more trees. And last week we talked about how we all then stand on the shoulders of all those who have gone before us. We're so lucky we get to be here. We're so lucky we get to be in a sanctuary. We get to talk about the name of Jesus Christ with relatively little fear. All we have to be afraid of is looking foolish for being hopeful, for believing in love. That's all we have to be afraid of. And that's not going to be much. That doesn't do much. Today we're talking about stewardship again in our stewardship series that we began last week. Last week what we focused on was the legacy that has come before us from Jesus Christ himself and then from all of our ancestors that are our personal ancestors and also just spiritual ancestors along the way. Teachers, pastors, priests, Sunday school teachers, grandparents, parents, neighbors, friends, people that invited us to church, people that gave us a gift of understanding the gospel, understanding that love is real and stronger than anything that would threaten us or terrify us. And we talked about how everything really does belong to God, that our money belongs to God, and we're, we're allowed to live on a percentage of that, that our talents belong to God, that our intellect belongs to God, that our relationships belong to God. Everything we have, every breath, every heartbeat belongs to God. And today, today we're building on that and talking about how stewardship really is an act of bold faith. It's actually an act of resistance. It's an act of resistance in the face of those forces and people and societal ways of thinking that would want us to cower. It's an act of resistance 
to every Facebook message that says that the country and the world is just doomed and we might as well just hang it up already and who cares about going forward with acts of goodwill. It's an act of resistance in the face of some media that would not want to show all of the good things happening around our world. All of the millions and millions of acts of unanimous goodwill from one person to another and would not want to show how we're so fortunate that the sun is exactly positioned in the direct space from the earth that it is, such that we can have life here on this planet. And the earth keeps rotating on its axis, and the earth keeps giving us food, and there's still people that love one another, and there's still clean drinking water, and we can still share with our neighbors we don't see much of that on the media, how lucky we are, how fortunate we are, how there's so much good in the world. On some versions of the media, we just see how bad it is because we all know sensationalism sells. And so to believe in the gospel and to be a steward of it is an act of resistance among these forces that would say, just give it up. So as we keep going on with our stewardship and as you're prayerfully discerning what your pledge is going to be for next week, and we're going to ask you to bring it forward next week, how can you give of what you've been entrusted with? How can you give some of God's money back to the mission of God in this world? How can you give some of your talents, your time, your energies, your service, your ministry back to this crazy, foolish, ridiculous movement that would dare to say that with what's going on in the world, with the difficulties and the trauma, that would dare to say that we have any right to baptize a person here this morning. How foolish is that? How naive? And yet we proudly say it. That would dare to say that we're all united here at the table of communion of our Lord and that all is well in the world because we have a God who loves us. We are a crazy, radical, upside-down, foolish movement, this Christian church. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. I'm so proud to be a pastor in it. I would never envision anything better for my life than to be this foolish in the eyes of this world that might be terrified and suffering. And so I ask you to think, how do you want to be in this coming year ahead, 2020? How do you want to engage in what we're calling in council a 2020 vision? What's your 2020 vision? How big is the gospel in your life for you, for the next generation, for the baptized, for those communed, and those who so desperately need this. Those who are not raised knowing this, those who are still in fear and in suffering, and who wait for us to go share the gospel with them. Please pray with me. Gracious God, there are no words to express our gratitude that in the face of so much that we don't understand, that sometimes is scary and sometimes brings suffering, still you are here with us. And you promise that you will never leave us. And you promise that out of every death comes a resurrection. And of every source of pain, there is love, there is new life. Thank you that you give us one another to encourage each other, walk beside each other. Thank you that for thousands of years this message of the gospel has been passed down by brave people willing to look foolish, willing even sometimes in history to be persecuted, willing to go through unimaginable suffering for the next generations and for us. Empower us, God, to engage in this act of resistance against those forces that would say that all is lost. Engage us to step forward with a portion of what you have first given us, our time, our talents, our treasures, to give back to the ministry of the gospel as it manifests at Cross and Crown and Rancho Cucamonga in the year 2020. Empower us, give us courage, give us foresight for the next generations to come, those who are not yet baptized, those who have not yet communed at your table of love. Guide us this week as we may better know how to love and serve you and this world that you love and that you've entrusted us with. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I ask you to stand and sing.